There's a very old Greek playwright joke. You have to imagine a tailor's shop in ancient Athens. A familiar-looking man walks in and throws a pair of trousers onto the counter. The tailor looks up and says, Euripides? The customer nods and says, Eumenides? That, believe it or not, is the starting point for the Euripides Eumenides podcast, which I think you will enjoy. In each episode, host Aaron Odom of Trident Theatre takes an unsuspecting guest through a piece of theatre history, revealing the stories behind some of theatre's greatest moments and behind some of its most infamous. So far, the subjects have moved from the Interregnum to Spider-Man on Broadway, from the avant-garde movement to the fight between the French Academy and El Cid, and from Burton and Taylor doing Noel Coward to the tortuous history of Rebecca the Musical, and many more. It's always a fun listen, told with knowledge, humour and a great love of theatre. You can find the Euripides Eumenides podcast on all good podcast apps and Aaron would love to have your company. So please, head on over and give Euripides Eumenides a listen. Welcome to this bonus episode for the History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Introducing the diary of Philip Henslow. This bonus episode is by way of an introduction to a series of episodes that I'll be producing for the podcast supporters on patreon.com. If you'd like to become a podcast supporter, you can sign up at www.patreon.com slash thoetp. And for a small monthly fee, get instant access to all members' episodes that I've produced so far. There are episodes on the life and works of Aristotle, Livy, Cicero, Socrates and Plato, and a look at the strands of Roman philosophy, the story of the papyrologists Hunt and Grenfell, and two episodes on medieval poetry. Eighteen audio episodes so far that all relate to or expand on further something that I've discussed in the main podcast. In the coming weeks, I'm going to be posting episodes based on the diary of Philip Henslow. He was a theatre owner and kept a diary from 1591 to 1609, which gives a fascinating insight into the detail of plays and productions during that period. The term diary is used a little loosely here. It's not a straightforward account day by day of happenings in the theatres that Henslow had an interest in, but functioned as an account book, a record of plays and takings, and a loan book. So it's not just something that can be read out loud like an audio diary. However interesting the individual details are, it needs a bit of context. The diary was first published in 1845 by the Shakespeare Society, and there are several editions produced as a facsimile of that original edition that you can get hold of. For this bonus episode, I'm going to read the introduction, so what follows now are the words of the then director of the Shakespeare Society, J. Payne Collier a journalist and Shakespeare scholar. His career was highly controversial towards the end of his life when he published amendments that he claimed to have found in a second folio edition of Shakespeare. These were later more or less proved to be forgeries in his own hand, but that's a story for another day and that tarnished end to his career doesn't negate what he had to say about Henslow and his diary. His introduction is an interesting piece in its own right, as he explains and summarises Henslow's diary and the associated historiography, so I think you'll find it interesting as a slice of theatre history, but hopefully it'll also prompt you to go over to the podcast Patreon site and look at the offerings there. I've put the links to Patreon in the show notes for this episode. I've made some small edits to the original where Collier wandered off topic a little, and any comparisons he makes to the value of expenses in modern times are, of course, comparisons to English currency as it was in the mid-1800s. So now please enjoy J. Payne Collier's introduction to the diary of Philip Henslow as published by the Shakespeare Society. The manuscript from which the present volume has been printed contains minute and valuable information respecting the history and condition of our early drama and stage, from the year 1591 to the year 1609, during the whole of which period Shakespeare was exercising his unequalled powers for the public instruction and amusement. Although his name nowhere occurs in the text of the following pages, the company of players to which he belonged was acting, if not in concert, in the joint occupation of the same theatre for two whole years, viz. from the beginning of June 1594 to the middle of July 1596. And it will be seen that in the list of plays performed, 
Not a few names occur, either identical with or very similar to, the titles borne by some of Shakespeare's undoubted productions. Whether they were older pieces on the same subjects of which our great dramatist subsequently availed himself, which he afterwards rewrote and remodelled, is a point it is not possible to decide, with our present means of information. To this question, we shall have occasion again more particularly to avert in speaking to the manner in which the manuscript, directly or indirectly, illustrates the life and works of Shakespeare. In the first instance, it seems desirable to say something of the origin and the history of the volume which, with the greatest liberality, was placed and has been allowed to remain in our hands for almost an indefinite period. We can hardly rate too highly the obligations of the Shakespeare Society to Master, Warden and Fellows of Dulwich College. In this respect, more especially to the Reverend M. Howes, who has charge of the books of the institution. The manuscript itself was first discovered by Malone. Dulwich College was founded by Edward Allen, and all of the known particulars regarding its construction are detailed in the Memoirs of the Great Actor and Benevolent Man, printed by the Shakespeare Society in the year 1841. Into these, therefore, it is not necessary to enter further, than to state that Allen seems to have deposited in the library or in the archives all the books and documents of which he was possessed, many of which had devolved into his hands from Philip Henslow, whose stepdaughter he had married, and with whom he was in a long series of years of partnership. The manuscript is mainly in the handwriting of Henslow, assisted here and there by some clerk or scribe whom he employed. It is a folio version of considerable bulk bound in parchment, and it was the depository of memoranda regarding all payments to and transactions with dramatists, players and others for a period not far short of 20 years. The book itself, from about 1576 to 1586, had been used as a record of transactions concerned with the felling, sale and consumption of wood in Ashdown Forest in Sussex, for there is the reason to believe that Henslow and his family were of that county. While many of the leaves were left blank, and while upon others there was no writing at all, Henslow employed most of the unoccupied space to register matters concerning the undertakings in which he was subsequently personally interested. He appears to have been first concerned with dramatic affairs about the year 1584, when he became joint lessee either of the Rose Theatre on the bank side or on the ground on which it stood. But no memorandum is contained in the manuscript before us of such an early date. Regarding Henslow's transactions of this kind between 1584 and 1591, we have no knowledge. He married a widow of the name of Woodward, who had a daughter Joan, which Joan, in October 1592, was united to Edward Allen. A memorandum of the event is contained in the manuscript, and it was to be observed that two entries immediately preceding it, dated June 1592, relate to the purchase of pieces of plate, which perhaps Henslow had bought in contemplation of the marriage of the young people, in order to be presented to them. Henslow's original trade seems to have been that as a dyer. In later life we find him and his stepdaughter's husband, who he invariably called son, engaged in a starch manufactory. He also appears to have carried out business of a pawnbroker, either in his own name or in that of his brother Francis Henslow and not a few pages of the manuscript are filled with accounts of advances made to various persons, principally among the lower orders, upon pledges of nearly every description. From the earliest date to which this record extends, Philip Henslow was in partnership with Edward Allen in their theatrical speculations, and they continued so until the death of the former in 1616. These speculations seem at first to have been carried out at the Rose Theatre. Afterwards, Henslow obtained some interest in the Hope Theatre, and in the commencement of the 17th century, Allen and Henslow removed into the Fortune Theatre, which they had built in Golding Lane, in the parish of Cripplegate. When the company to which they were attached was playing at the same house, and perhaps in conjunction with the association of which Shakespeare was a member, the performances were at a theatre in Newington Butts, which afterwards fell into disuse. At what precise period Allen and Henslow became tenants of Paris Garden, where bears, bulls and horses were baited, and which, not long after the accession of James I, was also adapted to the purposes of a playhouse, is not ascertained. They were deputies to Sir Ralph Bowes, the master of the Queen's Games, 
in the spring of 1596, and in April 1602, they stood in the same relation to Sir John Dorrington, who had succeeded in the office, to both of whom they paid a periodical fee. In the latter instance, it was £10 per quarter, but in the former, the amount is not stated. Connected with this point, we may here fitly introduce a document not hereunto mentioned. It was a privy seal in favour of Henslow, as Sergeant of the Bear Garden, to whose care the king committed the custody of a lion and certain other beasts, which had been sent as a present from the Duke of Savoy in 1613. For keeping and feeding them, Henslow was to be allowed four shillings per day, but, as nothing is said in the instrument regarding Allen, we may perhaps conclude that, although Henslow's partner in the concern, he was not recognised at court in any such capacity. When Stowe, in 1604, calls Allen the master of the bear gardens, we are to presume he is speaking to him as one of two leasees and not as an officer appointed by the Crown. Notwithstanding the omission of Allen's name, there is no doubt that as early as 1597 he had himself obtained a privy seal for some unexplained purpose, under which a patent was subsequently made out. Henslow's diary contains entries for the payment of 40 shillings for them on the 9th of June. It's necessary to remark that this volume, the value of which is at present so well understood and so justly appreciated by the authorities of Dulwich College, is not now in a state in which it existed when in the hands of Malone. This fact is established by the circumstance that Malone made long and curious quotations from parts of it that are not now found in the manuscript. These evidently formed a portion of it when it was for so many years in his hands, and in order that our work may be as complete as possible, we have added them in the form of an appendix. As, however, they have disappeared from the original, of course, we are without any means of correction or verification, and we have been obliged to take them as they stand in Volume 3 of Malone's Shakespeare by Boswell. There is good reason to suppose that, when Henslow first availed himself of the parchment-covered book for the purposes of entering his theatrical memoranda, leaves and parts of leaves had been cut out. But there can be no doubt that within perhaps the last fifty years it has been still further mutilated, and that many pages have been torn out, cut or otherwise injured, by inconsiderate lovers of autographs of the old poets and actors. In some instances, the signatures only have disappeared, while in others, the whole of an entry has been removed. This damage must have been done considerably before the time of the present or the late master of Dulwich College. Ever since it was restored by Malone to the ancient depository, it has been preserved with the care and caution due to an extraordinary curiosity and interest in the relic. Those who have the patience to travel through its details, with such assistance as our notes may afford, will be aware of how importantly and how authentically it contributes to our knowledge of particulars connected with the history of our early dramatic literature. We shall advert presently to a few of the points thus established, and recollecting that the names of nearly all the other play poets of the time occur, we cannot but wonder that that of Shakespeare has not met in any part of this manuscript. The notices of Ben Jonson, Decker, Chettle, Marston, Wilson, Drayton, Monday, Haywood, Middleton, Porter, Hathaway, Rankins, Webster, Day, Rowley, Horton and Co. are frequent, because they are all writers for Hendlow's theatre. But we must wait, at all events, for the discovery of some other similar record before we can produce corresponding memoranda regarding Shakespeare and his productions. It is quite clear that accounts applicable to the Globe and to Blackfriars once existed, for John Hemmage distinctly speaks of them in his will dated 9th of October 1630, and states that the books he had regularly kept would show how profitable his share for these two playhouses had been. If these books were at all like that of Henslow, they would prove not only the dates when most of Shakespeare's plays were originally brought out, but the very sums that he had received for them. More impossible things have happened than the bringing of light even to such sources, and the spirits of inquiry and research generated by the formation and labours of the Shakespeare Society may yet lead to the production of even more information, with the existence of which, at any former period, we are at present unacquainted.
We are certain that the account books of John Hemmage, one of the principal managers of the two theatres in which our great dramatist was interested, must have devolved into the hands of his personal representatives. When Malone found Henslow's diary, relating to the Rose, Fortune and Paris Gardens, it came upon him quite by surprise and late in life, and though he had it long in his custody, he was by no means accurate in the information he gleaned from it. While, as we shall see hereafter, he left behind him many particulars which we have carefully collated and deposited in the present volume. Our publication is the whole of the manuscript, exactly as it stands, as far as regards the dramatic affairs of the later years of Elizabeth and the earlier part of the reigns of James I. And in our notes, we have printed out such facts and particulars as appeared to deserve or require remark. Henslow was an ignorant man, even for the time in which he lived, and for the station he occupied. He wrote in a bad hand, adopted any orthography that suited his notions of the sounds of words, especially of proper names, necessarily the most frequent occurrence, and he kept his book and receipt dates in particular in the most disorderly, negligent and confused manner. Sometimes, indeed, he observes a sort of system in his entries, but often, when he wished to make a note, he seems to have opened the book at random and to have written what he wanted in any space he found vacant. He generally used his own pen, but, as we have stated, he, in some places the hand of a scribe or clerk is visible. And here and there the dramatists and actors themselves wrote the item in which they were concerned, for the sake of perhaps saving the old manager trouble. Thus, in various parts of the manuscript, we meet with the handwriting, not merely the signatures, of the following authors. Drayton, Chapman, Decker, Chettle, Porter, Wilson, Hathaway, Day, S. Rowley, Halton, Rankins and Waddison. But although frequently mentioned, we have no specimen of the handwriting of Nash, Ben Johnson, Middleton, Webster, Marston or Hayward. Among the players who sign their own names or introduce memoranda, we have nearly every man who belonged to the company. It should be remarked that Marlowe and Green died not long after the commencement of the diary, that Peel certainly did not survive beyond 1598, and that Lodge early diverted his attention from dramatic poetry. It may be doubted whether Fletcher is mentioned in the diary. Beaumont certainly is not, and Massinger, Darburn, Ford, Shirley and co., become writers of our public theatres too late to be introduced into the manuscript, the most modern date of which is 1609. At various times and for uncertain periods, Henslow was more or less interested in the receipts obtained by players acting under the names of the Queen, Lord Nottingham, Lord Strange, Lord Sussex, Lord Worcester and the Lord Chamberlain. The latter was the company of which Shakespeare was a member, either as actor or author, from his first arrival in London until his final retirement, which company subsequent to the accession of James I was allowed to assume the distinguishing title of the King's Players. Malone was not at all aware when he made extracts from Henslow's diary that it not only shows the number of times different plays were represented, but generally the very day on which they were acted in the first time. The old manager was in the habit of placing in a particular column or in the margin of the book and opposite the title of the new drama the letters N-E, the first two letters of the word new, which invariably indicate that at that particular date it was brought out. This is often an important and interesting piece of the information and it serves to show more distinctly the comparative popularity each novelty acquired. Towards the commencement of our volume, we could not contrive our printed page exactly to correspond with the page of the manuscript, and we have therefore been obliged in notes to state where N.E. was found affixed to the title of the play, or in other words, when it was originally performed. As Henslow proceeded, however, he adopted another course, and placed N.E. in the interval between the two columns, and we have been able to follow his example. Thus, by running the eye down this interval and seeing how often N.E. occurs, it's easy to ascertain how many new plays were produced at Henslow's Theatre in any given period. And therefore, we can get an enumeration of all the dramas represented between, for example, the 3rd of June 1594 and the 18th of July 1596. 
during the whole of which two years and six weeks, the Lord Admiral's players were jointly occupying or possibly playing in combination at the Newington Theatre with the Lord Chamberlain's servants. And here we find, by Henslow's usual indication, that no fewer than 40 new plays were got up and acted. For about 10 weeks of the two years, the company ceased to perform altogether, on account, perhaps, of the heat of the weather and the occurrence of Lent, so that two years is the utmost on which a calculation can be made. And the result of it, that the audience of the day required a new play upon average about every 18 days, including Sundays. The rapidity with which dramas must have been written is most remarkable, and is testified beyond dispute by later portions of Henslow's manuscript, where, among other charges, he registers the sums paid, the dates of payments, and the authors who received the money. Nothing was more common than for dramatists to unite their abilities and resources, and when a piece on any account was to be brought out with a particular dispatch, three, four, and five, perhaps even six poets engaged themselves upon different portions of it. Evidence of this dramatic combination will be found of such frequent occurrence that it is vain here to point out the particular pages where it is met with. Before we avert to other points established by the manuscript, we may be permitted to observe that Malone made some important errors and various omissions in the information he derived from it. He has mistaken dates and misread the titles of several pieces, which he had sometimes assigned to one or more authors of the works of others. He has also passed over without notice several plays the performance of or the payment for which Henslow duly records. We only mention this circumstance in order to put our readers on their guard against placing entire confidence in Malone's quotations as printed by Boswell. But having set these matters right in our notes, it's unnecessary as well as ungracious to dwell here upon the defects of a man whose sight failed him towards the end of his career, and who had the merit of being the first to find and to make use of this volume, the thread of which is much entangled and the handwriting not unfrequently extremely difficult to be deciphered. We have already spoken of the union of the company to which Shakespeare belonged, and for which he wrote, with that so intimately connected with Philip Henslow. This union, if such it were, and not merely at the joint occupation of the same house while the globe was in the course of construction, and for some short time afterward, lasted for rather more than two years, and, as has been remarked in the memoirs of Edward Allen, it is singular that most of the old plays which our great dramatist is supposed to more or less to have employed, and of the stories of which he availed himself, are found in Henslow's list of the period. Here we find a Titus Andronicus, a Lear, a Hamlet, a Henry V, and a Henry VI, a Buckingham, an Old Taming of the Shrew, and several others, the titles of which we need not enunciate, because they are inserted in the proper places, precisely as they stand in the manuscript. For aught we know, Shakespeare may originally have had some share in this authorship, or, if he had not, as he probably acted in them, he may have felt himself authorised, as a member of the company, to use them to the extent that answered his purpose. At the same time, Green could not have referred to this particular circumstance and period in so much as he charged Shakespeare with being an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, in 1592, in September of that year he died, whereas the account to which we avert does not commence until the summer of 1594. Green must therefore allude in his Groat's Worth of Wit to some previous transactions of the same kind. But no fact is more clearly made out that very much by the evidence Henslow furnishes that there was a very common practice in our early dramatists to avail themselves of the materials, whether of plot, of character or language, supplied by their immediate predecessors, and even by their actual contemporaries. It is remarkable that the first drama in this list, from 1594 to 1596, is upon a sacred subject, Esther and Azurus. It was not a new play on the 3rd of June 1594, and on a previous page we have the notice of Abraham and Lot. These may have been modifications to old miracle plays, traces of which were preserved upon the stage. Incidents from scriptures seem to have been still popular, and it is a circumstance not sufficiently noticed by the historians of our early drama that even at the time when Shakespeare was in the zenith of his reputation, stories derived from the Bible kept possession of some of our public theatres. Whether such was the case at the Blackfriars and the Globe, we have no means of knowing, but it is indisputable as regards the Rose and the Fortune. 
and in the following pages, distinct traces may be found of many such performances, beginning with a play in which a bodice for Eve was required and ending with a jerkin for Caiaphas. A drama entitled Nebuchadnezzar was represented in 1596, Judas in 1601, Pontius Pilate in the same year, Jephthah, Tobias, Samson and Joshua in 1602. And in the same year, we meet with a charge for pulleys in order to hang Absalom. The number of these sacred representations in 1602 forms a curious feature applicable in particular to that date and, as far as we know, to Henslow's and Allen's theatres. In connection, we may observe that, although at various periods theatrical performances were forbidden on Sundays, the companies appear to have been permitted to play on Christmas Day. And on the 25th of December 1595 and 1596, the representations possessed anything but a religious character. Such was probably not the case in 1601, for on the 24th of December, Samuel Rowley was paid £5 for his book called Judas, but Pontius Pilate, Tobias, Samson and Joshua were brought out in the ordinary course of business whenever a new play was needed. Having spoken of old plays acted in 1594, 1595 and 1596, the titles of which resemble some of those of Shakespeare, it may be worthwhile to observe that Henslow's diary shows that the poets who wrote for the company at different dates took up subjects which our great dramatist also treated, which had precedence must often be a matter of some speculation. But it will strike everybody as singular that in 1602, after Richard III had been long on the stage and was so popular, Ben Jonson should have been paid by Henslow no less a sum than £10 in earnest of a book called Richard Crookback. And for some new additions, he was then making to Kidd's Spanish tragedy. It may show that at the period the Earl of Nottingham's players could not venture to represent Shakespeare's Richard III, which was in possession of a rival company, or Henslow's would not have been given such a large sum in earnest of a new drama on the same portion of history. The arrest of Thomas Decker by the Lord Chamberlain's men in 1598 may very possibly have been connected with some piratical invasion of the rights and property of the association to which Shakespeare belonged. And less than three months afterwards, we find Decker engaged with Chettle upon the play called Troilus and Cressida. It has never been remarked that in July 1602, Chettle was writing the Danish tragedy, which may have been a rival to the old Hamlet, under a new name, in order to compete with Shakespeare's Hamlet, then in a course of successful performances at the Globe. There can be no dispute that Shakespeare's Henry VIII, as it has come down to us, was not written until after the accession of James I. But in June 1601, it appears that Chettle was employed on a drama called Cardinal Wolsey's Life, and that it became so popular that, at all events, one of nor two other plays were commissioned on the same subject. One of these was The Rising of Cardinal Wolsey by Chettle, Drayton and Monday, and the other the second part of Cardinal Wolsey, which may, however, have been meant for Cardinal Wolsey's life, which had thus become a second part. Hence, it is clear that other dramatists had availed themselves of the period of our annals before the death of Elizabeth. There are a few plays mentioned in the course of our volume that illustrate more strongly than Cardinal Wolsey's life the expense to which companies of old did not hesitate to incur in order that the characters might be splendidly dressed. The charges for scenery were none and for properties small, so that the actors could afford to spend more money upon velvets and silks, satins, lace and other personal ornaments. We are to bear in mind that at the date of which we are speaking, money was at least five times its present value. And if we find £10 given for a cloak or a suit of apparel, it is to be considered quite equal to £50 in our currency. In the entries representing Chettle's Cardinal Wolsey's life, we find £21 in a single item for two-pile velvet at 20 shillings 5 pence per yard, and for satins and taffetas at 12 shillings and 12 shillings 6 pence per yard respectively. This alone was equal then to more than £100 new, and the other items, of the same kind and for the same drama, proved that eventually not less than £200 was laid out upon new apparel only. At least as much was spent upon the seven wise masters. 
In one instance, £19 was given for a single cloak, while the gown of Mrs Frankfurt in Hayward's Woman Killed with Kindness cost £6, 13 shillings and no pence, between 30 and £40 in our present money. Taffety for two women's gowns in Porter's comedy The Two Angry Women of Abingdon cost more than £45, according to the same calculations. The contrast between the expense of apparel and the cost of plate is remarkable. Hayward did not receive for his five admirable acts for his Women Killed with Kindness as much as was given by the company for the gown of the heroine. From Henslow's diary, we derive very curious and conclusive information respecting the ordinary rewards of dramatists in the day. Those rewards seem to have varied sometimes according to circumstance with which we are now not acquainted. The highest price Henslow appears from the manuscript ever to have given was that for The Page of Plymouth by Ben Jonson and Decker, a tragedy founded upon a murder committed by a wife in 1591. For this piece, the old manager paid £11 in August 1599. For Decker's Medicine for a Cursed Wife, he gave £10 in September 1602. Patient Grazeal in December 1599 cost him £9 and 10 shillings. For Strange News Out of Poland by W. Horton and an otherwise unknown dramatist by the name of Pett, he paid £9 in May 1600. For Lady Jane Grey, he gave £8 to Decker, Webster, Hayward and Smith in October 1602. The Unfortunate General produced £7 to the authors, Hathaway, Smith and Day, in January 1602. Hayward and Chettle obtained £6 and 10 shillings for their London Florentine in the same month, and £6 seems not to have been an unusual sum. Henslow gave that price for Drayton's William Longsword in January 1598. For Earl Godwin in March the same year, for Hot Anger, Soon Cold, in August the same year. For The Boast of Billingsgate in March 1602, for The Blind Eats Many a Fly in January 1602, and for The Woman Who Killed with Kindness in March of the same year. The success of the first part of The Black Dog of Newgate, for which Henslow gave £6, seems to have led to the authors of the second part, Hathaway, Smith and Day, and Another Poet, to require an increase of £2 on the cost of the first part, as well as £2 for additions. So that, in the whole, they received £10 for it in February 1602. Dramas on sacred history raised about the same amounts, and Henslow gave £6 for Samson and £7 for Joshua in July and September 1602. The sum generally paid for putting an old play on the stage on its revival, with such changes as seemed necessary, was £2. This sum Edward Allen obtained for Tamburem, of which he was not the author as some have supposed, and for several others. But now and then the expense was considerably more, and Bird and Rowley had £4 in November 1602 for their additions to Faustus. When a play became unusually popular, and therefore profitable, gratuities were now and then, though rarely, allowed to the authors, by way of encouragement. Thus Drayton, Wilson, Monday and Hathaway received ten shillings as a gift after the first and doubtless gratifying reception of Sir John Oldcastle the drama imputed to Shakespeare on the title page of some copies of the editions of 1600. The same sum was presented to John Day in 1601 when his second part of The Beggar of Bethnal Green was performed, and also recorded is a similar stretch of bounty for Decker. He was paid ten shillings over and above the price of his Medicine for a Cursed Wife. The gift never exceeded this amount. Henslow appears also to have disbursed small sums to the members of the company to be spent in wine after successful first performances. But as can be seen from the manuscript, as the expense of an entertainment of this kind was 30 shillings, he carefully put it down as a debt. When Drayton, Chettle and Decker's Famous Wars of Henry I was read at the Sun in New Fish Street, the old manager expended five shillings, and the like sum was laid out in good cheer when Earl Godwin was accepted. Notwithstanding the multiplicity of plays written for the association with which Henslow was connected, it is quite clear from the evidence supplied by the manuscript in our hands, and as well as by obtained from other sources, that the wonderfully prolific dramatists of that day wrote for the other companies also. 
They do not seem, in general, like Shakespeare, to have confined themselves necessarily to one theatre or to one body of actors. It is very possible that our great dramatist was under some express engagement not to compose any play for a rival company. And it is certain, with regard to two of the popular authors in the pay of Henslow, that such was the case. On the 28th of February 1698, Henry Porter undertook that Henslow should have all the books which he wrote, either himself or with any other. And on the 25th of March 1602, Henry Chettle settled a bond with the Earl of Nottingham's players to write for them only. At these dates there existed a strong competition amongst different associations. But it must have been still stranger about 10 or 12 years afterwards, when Darbon was writing for Henslow, when the price of new plays had risen considerably, and where he was threatening the old manager with carrying one of his productions to the King's Men, from whose service Shakespeare had very shortly before withdrawn, leaving the company in need of assistance. Henslow, as we have seen, had never paid more than £11 for any play up to that date, to which his manuscript extends. But in a letter dated 25th of June 1613, Darbon asserts that he has been offered £25 for a new tragedy. What connection this vast and rapid increase in the value of new plays may have had with the removal of Shakespeare from London, we have by no means of determining, but the fact deserves more notice than it has hitherto received. Another circumstance in relation to some of our great dramatist productions has been recently and only recently averted to. We allude to the succession of the celebrated comedian William Kemp from the company which had always acted Shakespeare's plays. Kemp was a very popular performer as early as 1589 and he unquestionably belonged to the same association as Alan prior to 1594. He then seems for a time to have joined the Lord Chamberlain's players and we know that he was Peter in Romeo and Juliet and Dogberry in Much Ado About Nothing. He afterwards quitted that company and rejoined Henslow and Allen, probably about the time of the new theatre, The Fortune was opened. And in May and August and September 1602, Henslow makes various memoranda of payments to or on account to him. He could not have performed, therefore, in any drama by Shakespeare produced in that period. It will be found by those who are inquisitive regarding such matters that Henslow's diary illustrates the origin, state and progress of our drama, stage and its professors in various ways, which we have not thought it necessary here to point out, because they are generally explained in our notes. There is only one more particular to which it may be expedient to advert, and it connected with the office of the Master of the Revels, originally permanently created by Henry VIII. Edmund Tilney was Master of the Revels from 1578 to 1610, consequently during the whole period to which Henslow's manuscript applies. And it is curious to see how he gradually augmented his fees from time to time. In 1591, the fee on licensing each play was five shillings. But in 1597, he had raised it, as far as we know, arbitrarily, to seven shillings. In that year also, we hear for the first time of a monthly payment to the Master of the Revels of £2. In one instance, Tilney seems to have claimed the sum from Henslow for permitting his company to act for about three weeks. In 1599, he had raised his demand to £3 every month the theatre opened. We may presume pretty safely that he obtained similar payments from other companies. And supposing only four to be acting at the same time, which is no doubt a much of an undercalculation, his monthly emoluments from this source alone, without reckoning his fees from licensing plays, would exceed, in our present money, to £60 per month. As the Master of the Revels, he was also paid a daily allowance for his duties at court. His post must have been much more lucrative than it has been hitherto imagined. After Henslow opened the Fortune Theatre in the year 1601, the precise date cannot be fixed, he seems to have been obliged to give Tilney a double monthly fee for the Rose and for his new playhouse. The earliest entry for a payment of the Fortune seems to have been June 9, 1601, and we may infer, perhaps, that it was the first time that it had become due. If the notes here and there found too numerous, prolific or minute, the apology of the editor must be derived from the nature of the manuscript, which is full of confusion and abundant repetitions. J.P.C. Kensington, 21st of June, 1845.
So a slightly pompous Victorian style, but I hope you could work through the detail there. Some of the points there about the costs of plays, the way that the dramatists were remunerated and the role of Henslow in court life are particularly interesting. As Collier mentioned there, Henslow died in 1616, involved in theatre to the very end, and he died a successful businessman and, as we heard, respected in society. Under James I, he went as far as serving as a gentleman sower of the chamber, a role that meant that he served the king in private and on state occasions. Henslow's rise in society was not just down to his association with the theatre, but his many other business interests as well. But the role theatre came to play in high society for all its disreputable associations during the Tudor and Stuart periods is something we will be digging into in future seasons of the podcast. And just to finish off today, here's the only other variation of that Euripides joke that I could find. An Italian mother walks in on her son, who's standing by a bookshelf pulling out play scripts. He's ripping them in half. Hippolytus, the Bacchae, Hercules, then Medea. Shocked, she shouts, my a beautiful boy, why, why are you Ripides? Yes, the pool of Greek playwright jokes is pretty small, so if you know any more, please let me and Aaron know. And in the meantime, please do give Euripides Eumenides podcast a listen. You won't be disappointed. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Mm-hmm.